I'm very happy this afternoon to be doing a little presentation about Nikolai Gumilyov. Here's the book I'll be reading from, Russia's World Traveler Poet, Eight Collections of Nikolai Gumilyov. It's written G-U-M-I-L-E-V, looks like Gumilev, but you remember uh, the Prime Minister in Russia, Gorbachev, also used to have an E-V spelling. That's just a peculiarity of Russian spelling. Gumilyov, let me just tell you a little something about him. He uh, was born in 1886, and he died in 1921, he, having been executed uh, for alleged counter-revolutionary activities by Lenin, uh, so he straddled the two centuries. Uh, he had a most adventurous life in his 35 years of it. He was for a decade married to Anna Akhmatova. She's much better known uh, in the United States. Uh, they're both very gifted poets. It must have been quite a marriage. Very strong personalities. Uh, she used to be better known at any rate. Uh, Gumilyov becomes more popular now all the time. There's an entire website devoted to him, which is quite wonderful, and you might like to consult it. Gumilyov uh, went uh, five times to Africa. He really put into practice his idea of um, Mm, adventure. Uh, I call this presentation uh, Gumilyov the World Traveler. And by that I mean travel equals adventure equals risk equals self-discovery. That That is really the motto, the summing up of what he does throughout his life. He's the supreme uh, world traveling um, uh, adventurer in uh, Rus Russian poetry, or certainly one of the very finest. And uh, he uh, um, as an adventurer, was uh, attracted to other adventurers. It's interesting that when he was obliged to work for the Soviet bureaucracy in their literary division, he was put in charge of compiling, uh, collecting, translating, and overseeing other translators of major poetic works of world literature. And for his own translation project, he one of for one of them, I think the best one he did, he focused on Coleridge's poem of what? World travel, adventure, risk in an extreme degree, and self-discovery. And that is, of course, Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. I, I want to uh, just remind you how that poem ended in English, and then I'll read you Gumilyov's translations, only a dozen lines, uh, of, that is, of the, just the ending, just the conclusion part, because I think many people remember beginning and ending the best. He prayeth best who loveth best, all things both great and small. For the dear God who loveth us, he made and loveth all. The mariner, whose eye is bright, whose beard with age is hoar, is gone. And now the wedding guest turned from the bridegroom's door. He went like one that hath been stunned and is of sense forlorn. A sadder and a wiser man, he rose the morrow morn. Here's Gumilyov from Paema Astarum Mrikia. Tot molitsa, kto lubit so, says Dania itvai. Zachem, zachem, što lubishi hubok, nad eta itvai you, tsai. Mariak, z glazami iz agnia. Седою бородой ушел, и следом брачный гость побрел к себе домой. Побрел, как зверь, что оглушен, спешит в свою нору, но углубленнее и мудрей проснулся поутру. Is that wonderful? You don't have to be a, a Russian speaker, I think, to hear how lovely it is. The Russian language, of course, contributes hugely. It is one of the more beautiful things in this world of ours. But uh, then Gumilyov had his very special talent for music. And that's one of the things I like most about him. Now, to start with, I think I would like to use as my frame poem uh, one called Adam's Dream. And why is that important? I wrote something interesting about that this morning. I wrote... Adam and Eve were legendary history's first 
self-discovering travelers having left a protected garden for a protracted time of transition, which we're still in. So if we turn, I think it's about halfway through the book, to poem 97. That's right, here we are, Adam's Dream. It's a paradigm, it's a prototype, it's an epitome of the Gumilyov imaginative world. So it'll help us with all the other poems, although they all speak for themselves. They need a minimum amount of interpretation. I think I already gave you whatever key I have. Here we go with Adam's dream. Grown weary from dancing and song, Adam slept. Unwisely, yet peace he was needing desiring, the great tree of knowledge above him, stars firing the sky, shade of lilac had lazily crept on meadows where over his spirit was flying, but ill-boding dreams had arrived and were trying. Behind him, angelic, the fulgurant sword that pricks without mercy himself and his lady. From paradise, driven by trouble they'd made, he and Eve had to flee from the wrath of the Lord. Like beasts without shelter, they'll make a rude dwelling. With slingshot and club, helpless prey for food felling. Abode of hard labor and illness, but here with Eve he felt oneness, a love though belated, for her joy and trouble of motherhood waited. For him the stern spade, so a town might appear, my work by work for another, devotion expressing, with grief-knitted brows and lips palely compressing. Yes, both are transformed, mouths look grim and in pain. Their gazes don't gleam, random laugh, things aren't funny. While Abel is gathering olives and honey, wild boars lure the hunter, the powerful cane, contesting, sons challenge a fatherly chiding. The younger is dead and the older in hiding. Sore troubled, their father investigates here. His soul had been drowning in ease, dissipation. He's hopefully seeking a fane of salvation. Starts ever again. He is stubborn, severe, tries horse riding, plowing, and farming, and fighting. And God has protected his vineyard from blighting. He dammed up a river, controlling the roar. Some balance he needs mid the troubled world's newness. His falcon-like thinking cuts through to the blueness. Refractory land grants amenable ore. He finds in calm reading a cure for things odious, religion's deep secrets, and poems melodious. In magical nights on magnificent moss, the sylphs from on high have come down for embraces, most helpful as well. Healing injury traces, the stellar and element souls banish loss. The sun flashing height from the watery dark, blue dolphins have drawn Adam's light gliding bark. He loves entertaining and dangerous games. That could be a model for Gumilyov in, for his collected works. He loves entertaining and dangerous games. I translated in this collection eight books by Gumilyov, so I have a fairly complete impression of the way he lived and wrote. To seek in the ocean strange lands undiscovered, to wander where wolves have made clearings uncovered, encounter ravines that are hillscape in frames, where mountain goats now on the paths are descending, red roses their blooms aromatic down bending. When blocks of hard marble for carving are hewn, he loves the sharp grinding of chisel incising, the virginal cold of dawn's rose-fingered rising, a young oval face with the beauty of noon, a canvas these treats in perfection portraying seems brighter than life, all its radiance outraying. But Adam to heaven, his face riven, rent, turns hopeless for help, eyes yet blind and blaspheming, the sky appears empty and blank, while bright seeming there glimmers before him the many-starred tents. 
on calm holy nights, meekly peaceful, austere, knees bending, he dreams of a God not yet here. He daily awaits, coming in from afar, thoughts, radiant guests long awaited with gladness, and with them, though stellar their glitter, a sadness of thoughts yet unknown, nameless passion's bright star, of downfall in dreams and of horror in art, foreboding made Adam feel hurt in the heart. And mild-mannered Eve, the gods' plaything and a toy, now seeming a child, then a wild summer lightning, a tigress appearing with energy frightening, her shimmering pearls tell of strength to destroy, foreknower of fashion, of storm, ardent carmen, uh, or deadliest joy of misfortune, disarming. So... Gold will entice and embolden the gaze while hiding dire forces despite a fine seeming, arousing the weak, newly prone to blaspheming, and brothers their goblets of venom to raise. Unable to lessen their greed overreaching, vain frenzied lament is the lesson they're teaching. He struggles with Eve. He is serpentine, sly. She's bound in his net in seductive wild jumbles, a lecherous moaning in meaningless mumbles, yet suddenly saint with her eyes lifted high. Now moon maiden virgin, now crude bacchanalian, but always and everywhere alien, so alien. He's finally wearied, yes, mortally tired. He's sated with laughing and weeping unending. When swan flocks fly over, their pinions unbending, he hears not their calling, all vigor expired. To death on the cliff he is praying austerely. The deity folk overwearied love dearly. Beneficent one, will you hear my desire? On sea and on plain, from your heavenly portal, asperse in your mercy a dew that is mortal, quell heart that is dawning with life's final fire. Enough of my struggle with lunatic fear. Of dust I was made. Make me dust again here. And slowly, in kindling with bright crimson tail, a comet comes down with an eerie blue lightning. To Adam, the feeling is painful, heart tightening. His head is still hurt as by hard pounding hail. A whirlwind full flaming, his frailness had shaken. He shudders and shouts. And again, he'll awaken. Here's Tigris. A gleam spreading foam on his right, while left what he sees green Euphrates wave racing, with silvery glimmer the valley embracing, where playful dark sandbars are hiding from sight. Eve calls from her garden, her joy failing ever. You slept and awoke. I am happy forever. That's typical Gumilyov because. It's happy, sad. It's sad, happy. And in travel, travel through the world, not staying in the garden like kinder gardeners. You know, kindergarten means children's garden. And that's what Eden would have been if you hadn't been allowed to eat of the tree uh, of uh, knowledge. Wouldn't it have been simply a sentence to uh, a particularly severe kind of lifetime kindergarten? He had to go traveling. He had to risk. He had to take risks, a terrible risk. Uh, he. Uh, uh, had, however, in this way to discover himself. He discovered that he was a traveler. He discovered that he was a searcher and a pilgrim and a wanderer and a wanderer, and thus he would always remain. But he had to in, interestingly face death as he, thought it, as he thought he was doing in his dream in order to do that. And the shadow of death hangs over the uh, Gumilyov uh, project uh, uh, and will continue to do that. He courted risk and he loved risk. That's how he proved what he could do and be, to face death in uh, uh, directly and show who was the stronger. Well, he wants to get people interested in travel. 
self-discovery through travel. So, by the way, I noticed that as I ended the poem, the first page of the next book begins. It's called Alien Sky, and the cover of it was made by my collaborator, the artist and also professor of Russian at Binghamton University, Marina Zaleski. There are eight such covers in this book. It's a very artistically made book. And in the back, you can see all kinds of memos of Gumilyov and his friends and family. Now, in poem 35, I like that one because the mood is lighter and yet the, the thesis, so to speak, the subject matter, the theme, is going to be always Gumilyov's favorite, which is, don't sit there, get moving. This one is called Giraffe. Today I can see that your eyes are uncommonly sad. Your arms are exceedingly slender, embracing your knees. So listen then. Far, far away, on the shore of Lake Chad, the limber giraffe roams at ease. A gracious and elegant litheness is native to him. His hide is embellished with patterns of magical make, alike in variety strange to the moon shapes that skim and shimmer and shatter and sway on the waves of a lake. When viewed from afar, he's a colorful ship sail made taut. His running so fluent, the arrowy flight of a bird. I'm sure when at sunset he hides in marmoreal grot, a sign comes to birth of whose like never human has heard. I've tales entertaining of nations' mysterious ways. Black maidens, young, passionate fighters would die to attain. But you have inhaled for too long heavy, burdensome haze. You've lost all your lightness, believing in nothing but rain. So how can I tell you of tropical garden life glad, aromas of herbs unimagined, tall, elegant trees? Why we listen far, far away on the shore of Lake Chad, the limber giraffe roams at ease. I think, I think of him as taking uh, the opportunity to continue his attempts to cheer up this uh, rather languid and despondent uh, young woman uh, in uh, the poem Rhinoceros that immediately follows. So I'll do that too. See the monkeys shrieking, playing on the low, long lianas swaying that so low are drooping, drooping. Hear the rustle of their feet. It's the rhino sweeping, swooping, plunging through the clearing, preying on the slow with rage replete. See the general confusion, hear the pounding, no delusion if the buffalo despotic sinks more deeply in the muck. You who love the strange, exotic, do not seek for aid, collusion, run and hide and pray for luck. Lift your arms up high with singing, say goodbye while hope is ringing. Looks to rosy fog a fleeting, lead afar your thinking, and hid flockers, hear the greeting, through the waters quickly winging, coming from the promised land. I think myself that uh, Gumilyov is identifying very strongly with both the giraffe and the rhinoceros. Uh, travel, though, is risky, and we can't simply say that Gumilyov is a one-man tourist bureau. He does not scant the risks. And in this poem, called Contagion, one of them is spelled out in the title before we even begin. Nearing Cairo comes a ship with breezy banners of the prophet grandly sailing. Guessing where the sailors come from? Easy. From the east they are hailing. Shouts the captain mid the busy bustle. Guttural, abrasive, harsh the greeting. Faces dark are seen where mainsails bustle. Bright red fezes fleeting. The children rush in, pushing on. Their calves have come ambling and straying. They came at the rising of dawn. It's almost like playing. 
Storks on rooftops sit, observing, stretching their necks in calm collective, their perches serving for broad perspective. The storks are ethereal mages. That means wizards. Magi is the plural. They grasp the matter seeming hidden. They can tell why a red spot rages on a beggar unbidden. The storks, they shout above the houses, but none will heed their grimly message. What came with fragrance, with silken blouses, to town? A plague, a presage. Uh, in, by, in fact, by the time we just turn a few more pages, we get a travel experience. It's almost startling to read this a hundred years ago. Be that, that's when it was written. Because today, it's in the daily papers, always. On one page or another, this is called Forest Fire. Cloudy smoke, the winds are driving, pack horse black and corpulent. After it, relentless writhing air, the glaring flame unspent. Rare and strange, the light shafts rearing, dark brown poplar trunks between. Blazes, rosy pink appearing, mad on maddened field are seen. Maize field blazes with appalling sharp and acrid pitchy smell. Hissing, flaring, tree trunks falling to meet the rising fiery swell. Trampling, crushing, Din of thunder, wailing, bellow, squeal and roar, boding death, a quiet undertone of streams that boil and pour. Elephants, protection-seeking, run, the lion from his lair, leapt, the date-fed ape male shrieking, penetrating, rends the air. Lightfoot lion comes, eye livid, side by side with bristly boar, white-toothed terror, ire, less vivid, now is not the time for war. Next from smoky thicket soaring, pours in wave a force of flame, singeing, rushing, rearing, roaring. How may we these nightmares name? Hear him crack his whip. The devil, underneath the roof of hell, drives the roiling mass of evil from the underworld pell-mell to escape the suffocation, running, heartbeat feeling, burst, blinded by the conflagration, bloodied by the fire purgation, human beings perish first. I need a change of mood. You don't know what you're going to get with Gumido. That's the wonderful part about it. You know you'll get travel. You know you'll get adventure in your travel. You're certain that you will get risk of an extreme kind, most usually. And then you also know at the end that you will see an opportunity for self-discovery if you live long enough to pass the test. Now here, I'd like to present to you a couple of portraits. The first one is of uh, what you might call a hippie mystic. And then we'll have a more serious kind of religionists, Greek icon painters. Uh, they each stand up for their way of life. Uh, they're very different, uh, just as the happy, sad, the risk and the, and the joy of self-fulfillment uh, appear in Gumilyov's poetry. He does not want to shirk anything. He is really uh, uh, putting into practice the idea that uh, you should uh, be the scripture you sing. He embodies... Uh, what he writes about. He goes on these adventures, either mentally or physically, and he, he spends his life in motion. Okay, here we go. This is, I say, one of my favorites. It's called Drunken Dervish. You heard of the whirling dervishes? Rumi, the medieval Sufi poet, that is, 
uh, Islamic-based mysticism, but trying to go beyond all religious formulations. He thought that uh, we are all sparks of fire or particles of light uh, whirling at top speed around the throne of God in a giant circle circle dance and that is the inspiration for the whirling dervish dances he founded rumi did the uh, idea of the whirling dervish and they dance even today some of them came from turkey and performed right here in vestal new york and i got to see them this is a whirling dervish this particular dervish uh um, carries to an extreme a tendency that is strong in Sufi poetry. In Sufi mystical poetry, wine is very frequently employed as a symbol of ardor, of fervor, of intensity in the love either of a human being or of God. And indeed, they try to make it vague so that you could interpret their love poems either way. It's a very broad and open-minded kind of piety. But what happens is if you use wine as your symbol, your emblem of, uh, of what counts in life, namely love, you may be tempted to overdo things in the alcohol area. That's what happened to our drunken dervish. In the cypresses are nightingales, the moon begins to shine. Little black stone, little white stone, I have drunk a lot of wine. Then my heart beat louder far, my bottle melody has made. All the world is friendly, smiling, eyes ashine, the rest but shade. I've not come to love the cup boy just today or yes today not today or yesterday have i been drunken laid away but the triumph of my knowledge is a thing i'll never trade all the world is friendly smiling eyes ashine the rest but shade i'm a wanderer a loiterer a wayward man as well Every Everything I've ever learned I have forgot, it so befell, for a single rosy smile and one refrain, I am afraid. All the world is friendly, smiling, eyes a shine, the rest but shade. Now I'm going to the graveyard where my friends are lying low. Need I be ashamed to ask the dead what they of love may know? Hear a skull proclaim a secret from the pit where he was laid. All the world is friendly, smiling, eyes ashine, the rest but shade. In the moonlight rise the welling streams from out their misty lake. In the cypresses no melody the nightingales will make, save a single one who never sang before in darkened glade. All the world is friendly, smiling eyes ashine, the rest but shade. I just couldn't stop. I had to sing that whole thing. I should set it to music sometime. It's extremely musical. Now I promised you also uh, a contrasting but equally heartfelt testament, soliloquy, on part of a different kind of religious practitioner. Here Gumilyov is visiting a Greek monastery uh, where the monks have, are painting uh, icons, as they've done for centuries, if not for millennia. And uh, some people come and want them to adapt the newest styles. But trendiness is the very enemy himself. And they, they, that's the clear import of this remark. There is a prayer that I recall the master said, preserve us, Lord, from all disciples who are led to tell us that our genius, meager though it be, should blasphemously ask for new discovery. We'd honestly prefer a straight and open foe, but these men follow us wherever we may go. These men will gladly see us struggle till the day when Peter will deny and Judas will betray. The limit of our strength the Lord alone will know. Posterity can weigh how far each man could go. What we in future make is in the Father's power, but what we have attained is with us every hour. To injurers a humble kindness we will show. To those who put on airs we firmly answer, no. All flattering reproach, the praises of the crowd, 
in the creative sanctuary aren't allowed. No master will be crazed by henbane like the core of elephants from Carthage prior to the war. That's a really quite astounding conclusion. This man has in mind, from his uh, uh, scholarly readings, ancient Roman history when Hannibal, the Carthaginian commander, uh, getting his elephants drunk on henbane, managed to lead them across the Alps in an utterly doomed and fatal attempt to uh, uh, conquer the Roman Empire. He still remembers that, and he keeps it in mind when the trend setters are after him. Ah, let's see what we have now. Oh, this is fun. This is uh, Gumilyov looking at himself, or uh, it's pretty clear he thinks of them as images of himself from early, uh, as a early time as a youth, and then later, again, when older. It's remarkable how different they are while remaining exactly the same. This is called Sonnet, and it's number one in book one of his collected works. As a conquistador in iron mail, have I set out and to travel with a smile. In gladsome garden, resting for a while, but yet before the pit I shall not pale. I face a turbid heaven, murky bale, and laugh. I wait, continue to maintain a faith unfailing, for my star will reign. I'm a conquistador in iron mail. If it's a harder fate than I may think to loose the last reluctant fetter link, then let death come. I'll summon it, you'll see. I'll struggle with it till the destined end. Perhaps the hand that I, when dead, extend will get the light blue lily meant for me. It's like Adam, isn't it? He's eager to face death even though it seems like a, an Eden type of day. Uh, he calls himself a conquistador, that's a Spanish for a conqueror, but he doesn't seem to be interested in conquering, really. What he wants to do is conquer uh, his own laziness and keep going, keep moving, uh, be like the... Uh, I picture him as somewhat like Ponce de Leon in, uh, in Florida, who was looking for the Fuente de Juventud, the Fountain of Youth. Interestingly, he pictures himself as attaining finally at last the l light blue lily. Uh, that's a symbol of the unattainable for the German romantics. I don't quite know why it was ever uh, called upon to emblemize the unattainable because I find blue, perfectly blue, cornflowers abundant up here in, in uh, upstate New York in the town of Vestal. In any case, that's the emblem of the unattainable and guess when he attains it. When dead, of course you have to risk. You get nowhere without risk because that's what adventure is and adventure is what travel is for. Now let us try the old, a poem called Old Conquistador. That's number 58. It doesn't take him long to get there. It's clear he likes this theme and he likes imagining being forced to look death in the face and that sure enough will happen. Deep mid unknown barren mountains roaming, hazy desert heaven yet withstanding, came the old conquistador while homing condors glided, snowy height commanding. He eight days had wandered near starvation, then his horse had died below the only hanging ledge he made his habitation, not to leave the much-loved body only. There beneath a withered fig tree shelter, singing old romances of Castilla, of beloved's battles helter-skelter, he could see a crossbow, a mantilla. He remained as ever, bold, unvested, undismayed by fear, not caring whether death arrived. That warrior suggested, might we play? A bone dice game together? So, will he have bested death? Uh, I am afraid we're going to have to wait to see how the game turns out. Well, I'd like to try this one too. 
This explains, or rather it just gives you a snapshot of Gumilyov at home. Gumilyov at home is, as usual, when he's at home, tired of home. Listen, this is called antiquity. Within wild woodbounds of the park, the bittern and the booming frogs, mid grassy rustle in the dark, resume their evening dialogues. A house unpainted, antiquated, with vaguely floating fog is rife. The halls loud sounding, decorated with paintings, former peasant life. I think of sorrow, ancient Ruth. Ruth is remorse or regret. When grandpa laid out solitaire, each aunt with pleasant hand-picked youth in contra dances liked to pair. My homeless heart, how discontented that now the legacy must be. Such languid, boring, tired, tormented, ungolden age antiquity. Far better. Seek a looming slope where snow on moonlit crag may lie, where blue-gray clouds or black dash hope and avalanches groan and sigh. Now this very special kind of travel, dream travel. I want to give you a sample of that. He's done quite a lot of it in these books. It's appropriately called, this poem, Possessed. The moon, Round shield in heaven glides, who long ago a slaughtered champion had left. The beating heart betides an aching doom in lunar lampion. Past frowning woods and meadow haze, undaunted by the ocean's warning, lance ready, wanders all the ways, my monster woe, through night and morning. That's dream language, all right. It is in vain I take my horse and seize the reins with hand a quiver by frenzied lash the beast to force across a thawed and flooded river. In somber swamp, war viciously by neither side decided rages. He holds the balance over me who well in twilight battle wages. A darkness rushes through the eyes In frenzied full speed gallop racing From saddle toppled I'll arise To roam through murk all forms effacing How fearsome is that coup de grace Deep bruised by heavy armor braces I'll comfortless bewail my loss Whom a riddling fortune daily faces I'll recognize that muffled walk in fickle fog, in mist approaching, yet as before, my wits to mock, the unknown goes, no queries broaching. Come morning, I'll awake alone. Girls, cutting short their springtime play, will whisper, Torment made him moan, led by a shifting shape astray. Those girls understand a lot. They probably heard a lot of very strange yelling for quite a long time. Now I'd like to try a couple of contrast poems. What else have I been doing? I've got to get some new introductions to these things. You're going to get tired of hearing me say the same thing, but really it's wonderful. I, I, I can't get over how much I love his continual contrast because it means endless variety. If, I'm, if you're going to translate eight uh, collections by somebody, he'd better not be a bore. And I think I picked the right guy. Now this is, this is a poem I could not predict. And I think that when uh, uh, Gumilyov started it, he probably couldn't either. Backwaters. The sun declines in the west, past hills of the promised land. Still backwaters put on their best, dark blue and a fragrance command. Sleepily quivers the rush, a bat is flying, hush. A fish splashed in a pond, 
seeking their homes beyond, are all who have a home. With shutters of blue, comfy easy chairs too, a tea table cozy, a tome. I stay alone outdoors to watch the backwater sleep, where in daytime it's good to wade deep and at evening to weep. Because I love you, Lord. That kind of poem doesn't happen to a person every day. It's sudden, that outburst of faith, if that's what it was. Sudden joy, unexpected, just welling up in the idea, in the feeling. It's beyond ideas of, of being alive and of being one with the something, the, na uh, the nameless out there. Now here is another speaker. Of course, they're all Gumilyov. And this time he wonders to himself also as to where he stands with respect to the natural, the supernatural, this world, the next, being, nothingness. Interestingly, though, this is centered on a place where he has been before and he comes back. So he has present and past to think about right from the start. It's called Ez Ezbekiye, and that apparently is an Egyptian district where uh, uh, a venue um, is held for per uh, particular uh, emphasis on the best singers in the country, and all kinds of starring vocalists come and, and their craft is relished by the public. And I have a fr had a friend, Khalil Seman, he died recently in his 90s. He was in his 90s when I read him this poem. He had been to Ezbekiye. He told me things about it, and he listened to this poem, and he was most profoundly moved by it. Perhaps you'll see why. Ezbekiye. How strange, ten years already passing by, since I had visited at Ezbekiye. A Cairo garden, large by full-grown moon, triumphantly illumined on that evening. I had been feeling tortured by a woman. Neither the salty vigor wind from sea, nor murmur from exotic trade bazaars. Nothing had any strength to comfort me. I had begun to pray to God for death, and was prepared myself to bring it near. This garden, though, in every way was like the holy groves the early world had known. Thin palm trees raised their branches to the heights, like virgins whom the Lord might favor soon. On hillocks the prophetic druids stood in crowded majesty. The plantain trees, a waterfall was whitening the gloom, as if a rhino on two legs might stand. Nocturnal butterflies would flit about among the flowers growing straight and tall, or mid the stars. The stellar heights seemed low. Barberries ripened might the glows have been. I shouted, I remember, worse than woe, more deep than death is life, except, O oh Lord, this oath I freely give, whatever happens, whatever grievances, humiliations may come my way, I never will consider again the thought of light and easy death. Until the moonlit night when I return to see the plantain and palm of Ezbeki. How hard, ten years precisely, now have gone, and yet I can't stop thinking of the palm trees, or of the plantains, or the waterfall, that standing rhino in the whitened mist. Then suddenly I'll glance about me, hearing in windy rushing, or in distant talking, and in the horrifying nighttime quiet, a single word of wonder is Becky. Yes, only ten years gone, but somber stranger, I must depart again, must lay my gaze on the sea, the clouds, and all the foreign faces, all things that can no longer flatter me. Then to that garden go, repeat the promise, or say that I quite faithfully have kept it, And now I'm free.